Hello, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. I'm a hands-on software architect and also the founder of developer2architect.com. In today's lesson number 110, we'll take a look at the pros and the cons of event-driven architecture. There's been a lot of hype recently, a lot of interest, a lot of excitement about event-driven architecture, particularly within cloud-based environments. And I've read a lot of those articles, and I've read a lot about event-driven architecture in general. And what I've found is that there's a lot of services within cloud, or a lot of frameworks, and there's a lot of explanation about the good things about event-driven architecture. But I haven't seen a whole lot of information about the trade-offs and the cons of event-driven architecture. What makes it so hard? And that's what I really want to talk about in this lesson. So event-driven architecture, just to give a quick review, is an architecture style that leverages async processing to both trigger events and also respond to those events within the system. Everything usually starts with, with what's called an initiating event. This usually kicks off the process. Then we have processing events, which are generated by event processors, uh, that are part of that initiating event. For example, purchasing a book starts an entire workflow until I actually receive that book in my hand. For example, placing an order, or maybe the customer notified, payment applied, inventory updated. These are things that are happening in the system. Uh, a good example of uh, what we mean by events within an event-driven architecture. There are services, or more formally called event processors within EDA, uh, that trigger events. They do something, and then they trigger an event, an asynchronous event, in the system. Uh, payment has been applied. The nice thing about this model, this type of architecture, is one of a handoff. In other words, look at the payment service right here. Payment's been applied. I send or trigger that event. It's something that happened in the system, and I don't have to worry about what services or what needs to happen in the response to that event. There are also services or event processors that respond to events. And notice here, we have a one-to-many relationship. For example, order placed. Some event processor triggered that event, but then we've got other event processors that are listening for these events to process them. For example, I need to make a payment, I need to notify the customer, and I need to update inventory. All three of those things need to happen for order placed, and they do happen at the same time, which is also what gives us that high responsiveness. So event-driven architecture doesn't look that complex until it gets complex. And that's what I really want to talk about. I want to talk about those trade-offs, the advantages of event-driven architecture, I'll say EDA, and also the disadvantages, the cons of EDA. The advantages may seem obvious and somewhat clear. The first is really highly decoupled services because everything is asynchronous. Uh, we've got an intermediary, usually a service, a messaging service, or a queue, or a topic, uh, in between my services. And so I'm not directly communicating with that service. And that gives us a fairly high level of decoupling. Event-driven architecture is also great for scalability as well as elasticity. I've got a back pressure point built into every communication between my services. So if a service can't keep up, that's okay. I can still take in orders faster than you can process them. And it gives me very high levels of elasticity and scalability to know that eventually the payment will be applied or the inventory will be updated. And so each service can act as its own little island in terms of its scalability or elasticity needs. As a matter of fact, the high levels of fault tolerance are also because of the same reason. Services Event processors can go down, come up, but that's immaterial to me because I'm sending out an event. I'm sending it to a queue or a service. And so the idea here being it doesn't impact me at all. And it probably has the highest level of fault tolerance. Um, second to probably microservices just due to the single purpose, uh, fine-grained nature of each of those services. 
the high responsiveness that we get from event-driven architecture uh, becomes clear when you start to use it. Uh, I, as the end user, don't necessarily have to wait for all operations to be done. As you saw with that order being placed, I can do three things in parallel. I can adjust inventory, make a payment, and notify the customer at the same time uh, through the use of publish and subscribe or broadcast messaging. And that gives us super high performance as well as responsiveness. And finally, overall agility, that ability to respond quickly to change. Um, like microservices, event-driven architecture is highly, highly decoupled. And as a result, I've got separate event processes that are doing one thing they're responding to a particular event. And so change is usually isolated to within those particular processes. But there's an additional feature about agility that event-driven architecture has over pure microservices. And that is, in the middle of the day, during processing, I can actually take a service down and redeploy it. And the reason is because of persistent queues or durable topics or topics with durable subscribers. And because the point is all other services can still fire off events. And once I come up, I'll start processing those events. And so it doesn't stop the rest of the system. And so that level of agility, that ability to respond quickly to change is very high within event-driven architecture. So have I sold you? <laughs> because this is, this is what, and, and there's other benefits, these are the core ones, but this is what most articles that I've read really focus on. Let's talk about some of the negatives, the things people don't like to talk about when it gets to event-driven architecture. And the first of those is error handling. Error handling becomes very complex with an EDA. I never know when a particular event has been responded to, or if it fails, how do I restart that event? Uh, how do I do recovery? Um, who really is in control here with that event? Uh, what's the state of that event? Um, error handling becomes extremely complex. As a matter of fact, controlling the overall workflow is also extremely complex, especially when we start talking about CEP, complex event processing because most event-driven architectures are largely non-deterministic. Now, you might argue with me and say, Mark, I disagree. They are deterministic because I know where all those events are going and who's receiving events. And while that may be true, you can't control the timing of those events, which is the main piece here, that overall event timing, but also the order in which those events are occurring. And so when we try to look at the workflow and the timing of events or the controlling when a certain event gets fired or two events happening at the same time, uh, this is where the complexity starts to happen. As a matter of fact, event timing is really hard if event number one has to be processed before event number two. There's really very few, if any, ways to control uh, that kind of behavior within EDA. Another negative is that of coupling. Wait a minute. Mark, you said decoupling <laughs> was an advantage. However, while we've decoupled services, services or event processors with an EDA are still coupled by the contract. And contract creation and also maintenance is sometimes a very daunting thing with an event-driven architecture. And that contract, obviously I have to pass data within an event and it might include behavior as well. The last real kind of disadvantage of event-driven architecture is that of testing, uh, specifically scenario testing. Um, unit testing isn't too bad. I receive an event, I fire an event, good, it works. But how do I test the whole scenario? A good scenario being, I'd like to purchase a book. And I want to test that scenario all the way until it is shipped and in your hand. The problem is, Again, it's largely non-deterministic. And suddenly I have events fired that I didn't expect to be fired or, or, or um, uh, triggered. And now I've got events that weren't triggered that I expected to be triggered. Why did that happen? And I have to analyze all those conditions. Uh, the timing of events may change uh, the results sometimes. And so scenario testing is extremely complex. So I hope with this one slide right here that you're looking at, I've kind of convinced you that everything in software architecture is a trade-off. That's our first law 
of software architecture that Neil Ford and I coined. There are clear advantages to event-driven architecture, but I really want all of you to be aware of the challenges and the hard things about event-driven architecture. Well, we talk a lot about event-driven architecture and some of these challenges and solutions to some of those challenges. In our book, The Fundamentals of Software Architecture, we have a whole chapter on event-driven architecture in here. Also, for other resources, you can go certainly to um, developer2architect.com uh, for wonderful resources, specifically Software Architecture Monday, where these lessons are all housed. And so this has been Lesson 110, the pros and the cons of event-driven architecture. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope that it's given you some insight into some of the challenges that we face with event-driven architecture. It's powerful but it's also complex. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, stay tuned in two weeks for the next lesson in software architecture. Thank you.